Bibles to, cha- to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We're going to continue today, one more service at least, on how God values you. Last week, we looked at four specific scriptures, and we looked at chapter 15 in Luke, and we kind of skimmed over it. But people struggle with the fact that God values them. And we, we struggle with it for various reasons. We grow up in a world that says you are not special. Jasper has conquered that. <laughs> the world tells us that we're insignificant. We're just one in seven billion people on this planet. Our lives aren't really significant. We really don't matter that much. But God tells us just the opposite. He says every single one has value to Him. In chapter 15, we looked at, at, at the shepherd, the, the good shepherd, and how they valued, how they valued one sheep that would be lost. That was unacceptable. And they were willing to suffer and sacrifice to reach out and get hold of that sheep and bring it back into the fold. And it's a picture of Christ. There was no suffering, no sacrifice too great that Jesus was not willing to sacrifice so that one of us would be brought into the fold. We looked at four specific scriptures, and I'm going to quickly go through them. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, last week we noted that God has even numbered the very hairs on our head. And that's different from from having the total number. It's not God saying you have 123,000 hairs on your head. It's God saying that, that, that those hairs that fell out when you brushed your hair today, that was number 56 and number 4,821. It shows the intimacy and the focus and the value that God has on each one of us. In Isaiah 49 and and verse 16, God says, See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. In Psalm 139 and 18, it says, If I should count them, speaking of thoughts of God towards us, they would be more in number than the sand. God always has you on His mind. Amen? You should never stay up worried about things because God has already thought about them. He's already thought of the answer. And when you wake up in the morning, God is there with the answer. In Psalm 56 and verse 8, You number my wanderings, but my tear, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? God counts, He records every single tear that we cry. Every single tear that we shed. No matter what it is concerning. If it's concerning abuse or pain, suffering, heartache. Or if it's, if it's interceding for someone who's a friend or family member when we're praying. God recognizes every tear and He records that. Well today I want to continue and I want to look at Luke chapter... 15, and I want to look at starting verse 11. This is, is my favorite parable. And two years ago, I spent like five weeks doing a series on the prodigal son. And I know a lot of you weren't here then. And I'm not going to do another series, but I want to touch on this because in this story, there is an investment of God in us. Not only does He value us, But God, because He values us, He invests in our lives. God has invested in your life. And we see that in this this great parable. So let's look at verse 11 and let's begin. Then He said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So He divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. God, the Father, is just like this Father. He will let you mess up. 
He will let you go down the trail that you want to go down. He will allow you to ruin any part of your life that you want to ruin. He will allow you to ruin your physical body, your spiritual life. He will allow you to ruin your relationship, your your job, your family. God gives us a free will, and that's what this young son chose. He said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live this way. And Jesus is pointing out, when you get off of God's track, it always ends in destruction. It's not God trying to say, I'm going to force you to do what I want you to do. It's God saying, I've laid out a path for your life that is awesome. It's a pathway of blessing. It's a pathway where your life has fulfillment and your life has meaning and your life blesses others. And I want you to be on the path that I have designed because there's no other path that is as great as the pathway that I have chosen for you. Amen? Verse 14, but when he had spent all, when you're off of God's pathway, it leads to total ruin. It will cost you everything. He spent everything he had, all of his inheritance. He lost it all. And later on, we're going to see that it even cost him his shoes. He walks back barefooted when he returns home. There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. The son has a great need. How many realize that all of us have a great need? Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, aren't you thankful that everyone in this place, there was a time that we came out of our insanity and thinking we could rule and reign in our lives? We said, Lord, I want to do things your way. Amen. I'm tired of the way I've messed up my life, and I'm choosing God and the plans that you have for my life. And we came to ourselves. Amen. That's what happened to the son. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Church, I want you to make note. Every time you sin, no matter who we are sinning against, first and foremost, we're sinning against God. He says there, I have sinned against heaven and before you. His sin wasn't just against the Father. It wasn't just against himself. It was against God. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. Now, there's an expression there, that, it, and it is a literal translation of the Greek, fell on his neck. It's an accurate translation. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And some of you may wonder. It sounds like the father was a professional wrestler. He sees the son coming home. He thinks, I'm going to teach this boy a lesson. He's running to him. He grabs him around the neck, gets him in a headlock, and throws him to the ground. That's not what it means. It was a warm, loving, compassionate, fatherly embrace for a son who had returned. Aren't you thankful for that? Verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Amen? There's a celebration taking place. 
over the one that returns. How many would say with me today, I am the prodigal. And I have returned. And I have experienced the Father's embrace. And God has forgiven me and God has invested in my life. I'm thankful for that. I want you to notice in this passage though that there's more of a focus on the forgiveness and the heart of the Father and the investment that the Father makes into the returning Son than there is a focus on the Son's return. That's powerful. The younger son asked for his inheritance, verse 13. And immediately he, he goes and he, 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 he experiences the things that the world says, oh, this is really living. And young people, if you're teenagers, young adults, I want to warn you right now, the greatest testimony that you can have isn't that God brought you out of the pig's pen, but that you never entered in. Nancy was talking about it the other day, how for years she, she, she kind of felt like she didn't have a testimony because as a young girl she loved God, gave her heart to the Lord at a very young age. And as a young lady she went to Bible school and then went to the mission field and, and she never got into drugs, she never got into alcohol, she never got into immorality. She just lived for, for Jesus and God blessed her. And for years she felt like, well nobody wants to hear my testimony. Church, and young people especially, the greatest testimony that you can have is that the hand of God was on me. He protected me and kept me from that stuff. And I said yes, and I didn't go off like the prodigal looking for the fulfillment that the world has, but I realized in the Father's house I had everything I needed. I'm never going to say that I'm ashamed because I have never been drunk. I'm never going to say that I'm ashamed because I never experienced any drugs. I've never tried drugs. I've never smoked a cigarette. I thank God that He kept me from that. Now, I wasn't perfect. Everybody turn to somebody and say, Pastor, wasn't perfect. Some of you had way too much fun with that. I wasn't perfect. I'm a prodigal too. Every one of us have fallen short. But I'm thankful that I didn't get into the depths of the pig pen, but God kept His hand on me. There was a time in my life when I was pursuing the things of the world as far as financial gain. I, I made promises to myself. I went into business and I began to make a lot of money. I went to Neiman Marcus and had all my suits custom made. I had $1,200 alligator shoes. I had gold watches. Gold... I had cars. I had a new Lincoln. I had a new four-wheel drive Ford truck. I had a new Corvette. I had all these things. I had a nice house in, the, in Pennsylvania across the street from the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers. In church, I'll tell you, nothing of that satisfied. It's nothing. Now, I'm not saying you can't enjoy nice things. I'm not saying that God doesn't bless His children. But church, those things are all going to burn up one day. That's not what life is about. Life is about knowing the Father and living for Him. And it's about having the Father's plan for your life fulfilled. And that's what we see in this passage. How many people think today because of your past, you don't have a future in God? How many times do you feel like, well, I, Pastor, I went to the pig's pen. Pastor, I lived years for the devil. And because of that, you feel like you don't have a future. Church, I want to tell you, the God that we serve is a God of restoration. He's a God that heals. He's a God that delivers. He's a God that transforms lives. You're not the same anymore. Amen? I call it the Mack truck experience. 
If I was out here on the road and got ran over by a Mack truck, you'd look at me and say, Pastor Milt, my, you have changed. When God comes and runs over our lives, He transforms us. Amen? I want to give you an example. Johnny has a testimony. Johnny used to live a life in the pig's pen like all of us did. And, and he went to the doctor a while back and they did blood tests. And they found out that he had hepatitis C. And I'm sure he was devastated about that. But tell us what happened. I prayed about it. And then, uh, two weeks later, they wanted to send me to a specialist. So I went to a specialist. They did my blood work. came back to have nothing more system. God. So many times when we make mistakes, we say, well, I deserve this. I live that lifestyle. I deserve to, to, to suffer the consequences. The God that we love is the Father who runs to you and embraces you and kisses you and restores you. Don't ever think that God's heart is not to restore. Because it is. That's the heart of the Father. Amen? Our God is still a God of restoration. He's still a God who restores. In Jeremiah... He says, return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. In the great Psalm, 23rd Psalm, what does it say? He restores my soul. God restores when we messed up. I'm thankful for that. But I don't want you to get any cheap ideas about the forgiveness of God. Many times we think, oh, it's God's God, and He just says, well, it's not a big deal, I forgive you. In church, that's not true. He is a just God. He is a God of divine justice. And when His laws are broken in this universe, there has to be justice that takes place. Somebody had to die for our sins. There had to be a payment that was made. In, in Scripture, it talks about in Deuteronomy that in this situation, a rebellious son should be stoned. That's what we deserve. And in Psalm 49 and verse 7, listen to this. It says, None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give God a ransom for, for him, for the redemption of their souls is costly. What's God saying there? He's, he's saying that all of us are in the same situation. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We can't pay for our redemption. We can't pay for our brother's redemption. Because we're all in the same situation. The only one that could pay for our redemption and live is Jesus Christ because He never sinned. And God sent His Son. Your sin, my sin, cost Jesus His life. He left the glory of heaven, laid aside His power, His might, and came and lived as a man. And He died on the cross for our sins. Don't ever think that it wasn't a big deal with God. That forgiving was just a little simple, oh, it's okay, we'll just mark that off. No, God said, I love them and I want to redeem them. But somebody has to die for the sin. Justice has to be done because of the sin that transgressed the laws of God. And Jesus paid for our sins. I don't want you to limit the investment that God's made in your life of forgiveness. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, but God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you thankful for that today? Christ died for us. I want to look quickly at five things in this passage 
that show how God has invested in your life. I want you to look at the first one. He puts an end to self-condemnation. God has not given us a spirit of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. God doesn't intend for you to live looking back at the pig's pen and always being crying and sorrowing over that. He expects you, yes, to come with a repentant heart, but He expects you to say, God paid for that. He redeemed me, and I'm not looking back. I'm not going to let self-condemnation take hold of my life. I am walking forward in what God has done for me. Amen? Condemnation will hinder you from receiving what God wants you to receive. It will hinder you from being what God wants you to be. It will hinder you from reaching out with the love and the life of Jesus and making difference in people's lives. I want us to think about the walls that have been erected in our life because we harbor unforgiveness. The whole ministry on Monday night, Fresh Start, one of the foundational things is forgiveness. I want you to think about this. If the church really had a revelation of the forgiveness of God, I think the church, there would just be a dynamic move of God like we've never seen before. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean that we allow walls to be erected between us. I know, I know if, I, if I make a mistake or have a misunderstanding with Melinda, I don't really want to be around her until I make things right. And, and we, we do things that erect walls between one another, and we do things that erect walls between uh, churches even. And if, if it all goes back to our lack of understanding of the power of the forgiveness of God and what God has done in forgiving us. And I want you to grasp this, church. Because once you understand forgiveness and what God has done for you in forgiving you, you will never be able to hold a grudge and not forgive anyone else. Why? We talked about it a minute ago. When we sin, we sin before heaven against God. There is nothing that anyone can ever do to you that is greater than what you have done to God. Think about that. Because anyone who has sinned towards you and you've erected that wall and you've said, that's not right and that's not just and I'm just going to cut them off. Where there's been misunderstandings and you, you just build those walls, build those walls. It's a church of bricklayers. That doesn't happen, church, when you realize that God sacrificed so much so that He could forgive you of your sins. And when you realize that nothing that has happened to you, and I'm not saying that what has happened to you doesn't matter. Don't get me wrong. We suffer injustice. We suffer many times abuse and hurt. Things are said against us. Things that wound us. Things that aren't right. I had uh, someone just recently tell me that, that, that someone was constantly telling them that, that they'll never amount to anything. That their life is a useless life. And I told them, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Do not accept that. Because every one of us is precious. Because Jesus died on the cross for us. He took our sins that we deserve to be stoned. We deserve to be dead. We deserve the cross. And church, when you realize 
the sin that you have committed against God. And yet He sent His Son and His Son died in your place that you might have life. That you might spend eternity with Him. Church, when you come to that realization that everything that you've done towards God has been forgiven, then it makes it so easy to say, God, forgive them. They hurt me. I know it, they hurt me really bad. Lord, they abused me. They said things wrong. They beat me. They did this and that. But God, it's nothing compared to what I did to you. And you forgave me. So Lord, I choose to forgive them. And when you do that, the walls come down. And church, I don't want to see any walls. I don't want to see walls in my family. I don't want to see walls in your family. I don't want to see walls in our church family. Amen? And beyond that, what do Christians do so often? We argue and we bicker. We say, well, that's not how I interpret that scripture. And we say, you shouldn't worship like that. You should worship like we do. Church, when we come to that place of understanding the forgiveness of God, we will just rejoice with everyone who loves Jesus. It, it won't matter if they're their uh, form of worship is different than ours, if they have a liturgy and they go by this liturgy and they do things that way, if they love Jesus, if they've accepted Him into their heart and into their life to be their Lord and Savior, they're our brother and sister in Christ. And we need to tear down the walls instead of bickering and complaining. Amen? We need to tear down the walls. And just love one another. Amen? We need to love one another. Now, if someone is teaching something that is totally false from Scripture, I don't have a problem with saying, you know, coming to them and saying, hey, this is what Scripture says, and it's pretty plain here, and that's why I disagree with what you're teaching. That's okay. But when I run up to somebody and I say, I don't like the way you do that. I don't like the way you have church. You get too excited, or you, you have church and you're a bunch of frozen chosen, everybody just sits there like they're frozen. What's wrong with you? Where's your life? You know, that, that erects the walls. Instead of saying, I love you. You're my brother and sister in Christ. Let's tear down some walls. Let's realize the power of God's forgiveness and what He's done. I want to read what Jesus prayed for us in John 17. He was praying for those who would believe. That includes you and me today. He said that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prayed that his body would be one. And he says when we are one... The world's going to see that the Father loved them and that He sent the Son for them. How many want to be one? Amen? Now look back at chapter 15 in Luke, verses 18 and 19. I will arise and go to my Father and will say to Him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before You and am no longer to be called Your Son. Make me like one of Your hired servants. Make me like one of Your hired servants. James, I'm not going to call on you because you know this. Ronnie, I used you last week. You want to come and help me again? If you weren't here last week, I had a lot of fun with Ronnie because he's got an awesome testimony. He was a drug addict for 40 years. And God got a hold of him and set him totally free. Something else. He should have been in jail. But God showed him divine favor. He should have been killed. But God kept his hand upon him. He is a prodigal and he rejoices every Sunday in what God has done for him. But what I want you to see in this passage, last week I was over here and he was over there and I said the moment that God saw him, saw him 
The father saw him. He ran to him and he embraced him with an overwhelming embrace. Amen. And he kissed him. I'm not going to kiss you. <laughs> he goes, thank you. But I want you to notice the prodigal, he was, he was coming back and he was rehearsing this over and over in his mind. What I'm going to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I can just see the prodigal going over that, Father. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. All of those things are true. But notice... In the Scripture, when the Son gets to the Father, he's, he's embraced by the Father. He doesn't get to say the last part of that. The Father stops him. It says, but the Father. It's somehow the Father stopped him from saying, make me like one of your hired servants. Say that. Make me like <laughs> There's a verse missing in Scripture. It's... <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. I love that. I never get tired of that. I am so thankful for that. Amen. Amen? Because we are restored as sons and daughters of the Most High God. He brought us out of the pig's pen. But He has restored us. He's invested in us. Forgiveness, church. And we are not second class citizens. We are fully restored in Christ Jesus. Ronnie is a number one son. I'm a number one son. Johnny's a number one son. How many have ever been on the... Remember when you were a kid in elementary school and you were playing games and there would be two captains... And then all the kids would line up and they'd say, I choose Hannah because she's tall and she's going to be a better basketball player. So I choose her first. Then they'd come to Lexi and say, she's kind of short. I'm going to wait on her. How many have ever been there? For one reason or another, you weren't the first two or three kids picked. You were at the very end. Hey, be honest. Maybe it wasn't in athletics. Maybe it was in math class and you were fixing to have a math competition and you weren't too swift at math and everybody in the class knew it and so they were, they were picking teams and they, nobody wanted you on their team. Church, that never happens with our God. You are the number one pick through Jesus Christ our Lord. Every one of us has that value. God says, I choose you first. I choose you first. I choose you first. You're number one. There's no second class children in the kingdom of God. Oh, somebody ought to be happy about that. I'm glad. I'm thankful for that. He places a robe of righteousness on us. Number two. Well, let me go back to verse 22 quickly. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. As number one children, we have received that robe of righteousness. And I want, I want to say something else about that. The first, I don't have time to go into all this very deep, but I want to say this. The robe of righteousness, Scripture talks about a robe of righteousness. The, the robe there in the original Greek, it, it's, we translate it best robe, but it was literally the first robe. The first robe was significant in that culture, not just because of its quality and its beauty. It represented those who had resource. And church... As a child of God, you have all the resource you ever need through Him. 
I could go there, but I'm not. But the robe, there's no doubt that this son... He came back, he was barefooted. He came back, he had been in the pig's pen. I want you to picture him in the pig's pen. He probably had pig dung on his feet and on his legs, probably had mud. He probably had scars from the pigs pushing him around and cutting his legs and bruising. He probably had scars on his hands or arms and bruises on his, on his body. He probably on the way home stopped at a creek and tried to clean up a little to be presentable to the Father. But church, you can't make yourself presentable to God. You have to come to Him and let Him clothe you with the robe. And the thing about the robe is a servant's robe went down to the knees. But the best robe the robe of the number one son went all the way to the ground. In other words, everything of the past was completely covered. There was no sign of the mud and the scars and the bruising. There was no sign that he had ever been in the pig's pen once the robe of righteousness was placed on him. Amen? Oh, come on, church. Somebody ought to do your happy dance. Amen? I'm wearing a robe of righteousness. My past is covered by the blood of Jesus. My past is taken care of. And God has clothed me in the, in the robe of a number one son. Oh, I love that. I love that. He places a robe of righteousness on us. Oh, Thank you, Jesus. Number three, he presents us with a ring of privilege. The ring there would have been a signet ring. It was a ring that had the family seal that would have been used to seal documents uh, that were legal documents. It was a, a, a ring that would allow the son to conduct the Father's business. I want you to hear that. God was investing authority back in the Son. He was investing resources back to back the Son again. That's why the older brother was so upset. Because he had taken his inheritance, he had gone and squandered all of it, now he's coming back and he's given all these resources, he's reinstated to the position as if he had never left, and they're going to throw a party for him. And there's a message there that Jesus wants us to hear. Don't ever be upset at the blessing of God in the lives of others, because our God has all the resources that any of us ever need. God's not going to run out of resources. Sometimes we get upset when another church is being blessed. And that envy rises up. That jealousy rises up. Church, that's not of God. We need to rejoice in what God's doing in our, in our families, other churches. Amen? But it's okay to say, Lord, I want some of it too. Because you are a God of resources. And Jesus wanted to make that clear. You don't, you don't need to be upset when God's blessing someone else. You rejoice with them. That ring represents authority, church. God has invested authority in you. Now, don't take me wrong, but there are, are sometimes people at the end of the service will call our prayer team up here and they'll, they'll pray for them. And, and sometimes there are people that will come up to me and say, Say, Pastor, I, I want you to pray for me. And I, I love to pray for people. Don't get me wrong. But I want you to understand all of us have authority. Amen? All of us have powerful prayers. In fact, in Mark 16 and 17, some of the last words of Jesus to the church, He says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Not those who are exalted leaders. 
Not those who are deacons or elders or staff. Those who believe. And then he says, in my name they will cast out demons. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Don't ever be afraid of the power of hell because greater is Jesus Christ in you than anything that hell can throw against you. Our God is greater. It says they will speak with new tongues. That's a reference to what happened in Acts when they gathered in the upper room and the Spirit of God was poured out upon them and they began to speak in languages that they didn't learn. It was supernatural. It was the gift of God. It says they will take up serpents. That doesn't mean we need to have special services where we handle snakes and tempt God. What it's referring to is the protection of God. It means to cast off a snake, just like Paul. Later on in the book of Acts, you see where he's reaching in to gather some firewood, and a poisonous snake was there and, and grabbed hold of him, bit him, and everybody thought he was going to die because it was poisonous snake. What did he do? He just flung it off. It didn't affect him at all. It was God's protection. Church, God will protect you until the very moment he's ready for you to go home to be with him. You don't have to fear the enemy. Now, I don't want you tempting God. I'm not saying you need to be all evil Knievels and go jump buses on a motorcycle or something. But I'm saying you can live your life without fear of death. And, and God has conquered death. And when you get ready to go, God's ready for you. You ought to be ready. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with Him. When you're ready to go, the Bible says it's far better to go to be with Jesus. So many times we get upset when someone young dies and we think, oh, their whole life was ahead of them. It's far better to be with Jesus. I know we miss them and we feel bad and we sorrow, but they're better off, church. And I could go on and I'm not going to. If they drink anything deadly... It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Church, when was the last time you prayed for someone who was sick, you anointed them with oil, you laid hands on them, and you believed that God was going to touch their body and God healed them? It should happen all the time in the church. When we recognize the power of forgiveness and what God has invested in us. He's given us the authority to do His business. Jesus can't be everywhere at the same time. Right? And we are His body. We're to minister. We're to go about God's business. Don't be afraid to listen to the Spirit when you're in Fred Myers or Target or Walmart, wherever. And, and, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And you, you tune in on somebody. Don't be afraid to walk up and say, excuse me, but I, I just really felt like God laid you on my heart. Is there something I can pray about? Or maybe the Spirit told you that, that you needed to pray for healing. And maybe the Spirit told you they had cancer. And you, you just you feel led. Don't be afraid to step out in faith and to be about your father's business because you have his signet ring. You have his ring on your finger. It says, I have given my son or daughter authority to operate in the business of God. Number four, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go through this. Number four, he points to a pathway of unfolding joy. Church, you will never experience tremendous joy when you're on your own path. You're not. It's when you're on His path. The Bible says that there is fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. Fullness of joy. It doesn't get any better than that. I remember years ago, I was in, in the little town of Wrangell in southeast Alaska. And there was a lady that came in and her husband had taken his life. She herself had a drinking problem. She would come in at first and you could smell the alcohol on her. But we loved her. We welcomed her in. 
And I remember a specific service. She was sitting on this side of the auditorium. She was back about five or six rows. And God was moving and God was healing and touching hearts. And all of a sudden, this woman who was so broken, who was so beaten down, she just erupted in laughter and just began to bubble up the joy of the Lord. And you saw her countenance change. You saw God bring healing from that. And it transformed her life. God's joy will transform your life. It says in this text that they put shoes on His feet. In Scripture, when shoes are removed, it was a sign that the enemy had conquered you. Because when the enemy would conquer you, they would take all of the shoes off of the conquered people and they would force the people to walk behind the king and his procession and they would march them back to the king's homeland in his city and all of them would be walking behind. Their feet would have been bruised, they would have been bloody, they would have been in their shame and their filth. And it meant the enemy had conquered them. But the opposite is true, church. In Scripture, in Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel when his wife had died, he was in mourning. And God comes to him after a period of mourning and God tells him to put on his shoes. To put on his shoes and mourn no more. The shoes were a sign again of the son's restoration, but it was a sign that he was back on track. The mourning for his past pig's pen's life was over, and God put on dancing shoes. Amen? Oh, some of y'all aren't getting this. I'm up here preaching my heart out. James, has God put your dancing shoes on? Has God put your dancing shoes on? Are you filled with the joy of the Lord? And you're not, you're not worried about the past? Amen? Okay. Do what I do. All right. Okay. You got your dancing shoes on? <laughs> and finally, in Luke 15, 23 and 24, He provides a feast for the family celebration. There's a celebration in heaven over one lost soul that comes back to God. Amen? When you and I said yes to Jesus, all of heaven erupted in celebration. Amen? And there is a celebration feast every time we come to the Lord's table. It is a celebration feast remembering what God has done for us. In verse 23 in Luke 15, And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Church, if you've been a prodigal and God has brought you back, you should live a life that celebrates what God has done for you, and you ought to be merry. Amen. You ought to be merry about it. Hallelujah. No matter what God's brought you from. It's a celebration. When we come to the Lord's table, it tells us to remember Jesus. To remember His body that was given for us. Remember His blood that was shed for us. To remember what He did for us. Church, I've been a Christian. I've been in church since the first, like Kaysen. Little Kaysen, he's here. It's his first Sunday. He was born this week. I was in church every Sunday of my life, almost every Sunday night and every Wednesday of my life. I grew up in the church. I grew up hearing what Jesus did for me. But church, I never get tired of the story. I never get tired of the story. 
I never get tired of what Christ did for me. And, and how He forgave me. How He placed authority in me. How He put a robe of righteousness and a ring on my finger and shoes on my feet. I never get tired of what Jesus has done for me. And I never get tired of wanting to go and be His hands and His feet extended. To be His message. To go about my Father's business. There's nothing I want to do more than tell people about Jesus. That's my heart. I want the worship team to come. And I want the prayer team to come. Church, listen to this. If your sin and my sin was powerful enough to take Jesus to the cross and kill Him, it was powerful enough to keep Him there unless the cross is power was greater. In church, Jesus rose again because the power of the cross was greater than all the power of hell. And He lives. I want to ask you today, is there an area in your life where there are walls that need to come down? Are there areas in your life where you don't feel significant? Where you don't feel like a number one son or a number one daughter? Are there areas in your life that you just need to bring to Jesus today? And say, Lord, I want to live that life Pastor Milton's talking about. Will you stand? Church, two years ago, I spent several weeks in depth in this passage. And here it is two years later, and I've touched on it between now and then. But church, I never get tired of the prodigal son. Because every time I read it, I know I'm that prodigal son. And every time I read it, I'm refreshed because I realize how precious a gift God has invested in me. How valuable I am to Him. And that's my prayer for everyone here today. Don't think that you're not significant to God's plan. Don't think that you're a second class citizen. But know that you've been clothed in the robe of righteousness the ring of authority is upon your finger, that the shoes of joy is restoration are on your feet. And don't let that lie of the enemy that you're not special to God abide in your life. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for this time together today with your children. Lord, I thank you for your precious word. Lord, I love the prodigal son. And Lord, I'm thankful for what you have invested in us, in every one of us. And Lord, help us to leave this place with boldness, going in the authority that we've been given, knowing that we our number one children going in the joy of the Lord and Lord if there's anyone that's struggling with forgiveness today I pray that they would come forward and just pray with us and come to that place that they can forgive Lord I I pray if they're struggling with unforgiveness or or bitterness or resentment or other things, Lord, that they would go to Fresh Start on Monday nights and really press in and come to that place where they can be set free.
Lord, if there's any one here today that hasn't made a commitment to you, Lord, I pray that today they would come and say, I want to make a commitment to the Lord. Maybe they've drifted away. I pray, Lord, that they would come and say, I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want to walk with Him all the days of my life. I want the blessings of God in my life, in my family's life. Lord, I pray that you just draw us by your spirit. As the worship team begins to lead us, if you have a need, will you step out and come and pray with our prayer team today? Will you come? If you have another need of any kind, will you come? Will you come? That's God's heart saying, will you come to me? Will you take that step like the prodigal? The Father will come running and embrace you. Will you come? Let's worship. You stood before
Hello, it's Pastor Milt here, and I want to personally thank you for joining us today as we worship the Lord. And I pray that the message touched your heart. And I want to give you a personal invitation. If you've never opened up your heart, opened up your life to the Lord, I want to invite you to do that today. Just pray with me this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I've made many mistakes. I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sin, to come into my heart, to come into my life, to be my Lord and my Savior. Lord, just make my life anew. Lord, I just surrender my life to you. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. If you prayed that with me, then I believe that you're born again. God's come into your heart and life. He's changed your life. He's forgiven you of all your past, no matter what it is. And today is a new day of beginning for you. And I want to invite you, if you'd like to pray with us for the next 30 minutes, we'll have someone manning the phones so that they can pray with you. If you have a, a, a financial need or a physical need or a spiritual need, whatever that need is today, we want to welcome you to just Call us and pray with us today. And the number is 907-414-1038. God bless you, and I hope you'll tune in and be with us next week.